Welcome to episode 16 of the Confounded Chronicles, and likely my most dangerous episode yet. So a few years ago, I had built a foundry furnace to basically melt aluminum down uh, and try some casting with it. Uh, I have lots of scrap aluminum, and um, aluminum is actually decently expensive to buy, and it's a lot of fun to melt, and I wanted to experiment with casting. Um, and when I was building the concrete lathe, there was a lot of parts that I needed to make, and uh, at the time I didn't have a very... I didn't have my, my mill, I had my CNC router, which worked okay, but to get a lot of uh, aluminum parts out of it, it was a lot easier to cast it, and a lot more fun. Uh, so something I played with, I built my very first uh, furnace out of just an old IKEA stainless steel IKEA garbage pail, um, and I filled it with concrete, and uh, I mean, that's not the best refractory material to use, be because lots of reasons, just Google them, they can explode and all kinds of nastiness. Uh, I let it set for a long, long time, brought the temperature up slowly, and, and it worked out well. I had a few cracks in it, but no, I, it didn't kill me. Uh, with this new furnace I built, I wanted to have something that was a little more efficient, a little more uh, easy to use. The old one I was using was with uh, charcoal, it's a charcoal powered furnace, uh, which worked okay and let me melt aluminum and I was using uh, like an old propane bottle, um, one of those small camping propane bottles uh, for crucibles and those would last like two or three runs and then they would burn through and they would leak into my furnace and it would cause all kinds of issues. So, uh, I wanted to get back into that, especially for when I'm redoing the concrete lathe here, there's a lot of parts I want to make for it, and just buying the aluminum chunks is going to cost me like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars, just, just because aluminum is like, I can get it at seven bucks a pound, and when you have to buy, you know, a hundred odd pounds, well, not a hundred odd pounds, but let's say 50 pounds of aluminum that's probably going to go into that lathe yet, uh, it gets expensive, um, and it's not really a project that, um, how, do I, how do I put this, if I'm selling parts, it's it makes a lot more sense just to buy material and make the part out of it because you recoup the losses when you sell it or you recoup the cost of the, the metal. Um, when it's something that's kind of just like a pet project, something I'm working on, uh, it's something that I'm willing to take more liberties with time and that's why we're doing the aluminum. And melting aluminum is fun and it's fun to watch and I enjoy watching like casting videos and stuff like that so I'm gonna use some of that to build parts of the lathe. So with all that said, I basically went ahead and built a new foundry uh, or a foundry furnace is a proper termination I suppose. Uh, what I ended up using was a just a big steel uh, just glue container, big steel glue container. Uh, clean the paint off it. Probably wasn't necessary, as I later figured out. Um, what I used for refractory is I used just some plaster of Paris and sand, which is a terrible refractory. Don't use it. Um, the first time I used it uh, on this particular furnace, I had cast the walls and the base and the lid, uh, and then I. Even before firing, I realized it, this is probably not going to hold up. Um, it's a great insulator, it's very good for that, but just to hold that, hit that direct flame on it, it, it dries out and it flakes and then it spalls and it, it's not a good choice. Um, also with this whole project, I didn't want to invest a lot of money into it. Uh, I, I do have plans to build a better furnace, maybe way down the road, um, but I wanted something that would be a balance. A balance, not concrete that'll kill me, not expensive refractory cement, because uh, I can't get it locally, I have to import it and, and that gets really expensive. Uh, so what we did with this one is we used the uh, plaster Paris sand mixture to kind of act as an insulator and then what I did is I lined it with fire brick and I put fire brick on the bottom uh, and then on top of that fire brick I coated it in fire cement. Um, all these materials I was able to get locally. These are hard fire bricks, they're not soft fire bricks. So um, a lot of the foundries you see or furnaces you see built on YouTube uh, use the soft fire brick uh, which is kind of a white about two inch thick brick and it's very fragile. These are hard fire bricks so they're about an inch and a half thick um, but they're like they're like bricks. You can drop them and they're not gonna they're not gonna shatter into a million pieces. They're actually really hard to cut too. So lined the uh, furnace with that. Uh, did the lid initially just with the the plaster Paris hand mix. I figured it would probably hold up after three test firings. Uh, the lid basically just crumbled apart, fell into the furnace. So I decided I had to rebuild the lid. Uh, I took the same fire bricks. I had a bunch of extra and I laid a couple into the lid. Um, then just put some of the plaster Paris kind of sand mixture around the edge to hold it in place. And, uh, and then coated the top of the fire bricks with more fire cement. I keep coating with fire cement because fire cement actually has a little bit higher uh, temperature rating than the actual fire brick. The next step in all this madness was to basically find a way to reliably house aluminum. Uh, once again, I was going to go the cheap route and just use more of those camping bottles, those propane bottles. Uh, once again, I kind of have a relatively constant source of empty bottles of those. But they're annoying because you have to take the valve off, you have to fill them with water, you have to cut them. It's it's kind of dangerous cutting into propane bottles, no matter how many, how careful you are about it. Um, it's just still not something that's the most fun to do. So I looked online and honestly for a clay graphite crucible nowadays, it's really inexpensive. I was able to get this one. I think this is a number eight crucible, so it'll hold eight. I think they rate it at eight kilograms of copper. I think that's how they rate them. 
Um, it's huge. It's, it's way bigger than I probably should have bought. Um, but it was like 60 bucks, 60, 70 bucks Canadian uh, shipped like next day to my door. So uh, can't compete with that. It's going to last a heck of a lot longer than steel crucible, especially in this furnace, which is a little bit more powerful. Uh, so once that was made, we basically were able to put everything in the furnace and get ready for the first firing. And like I said, with the old furnace, I was using charcoal, which works great. It burns really hot, um, especially if you're using lump charcoal, which is just like a car, carbonized, car, 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 it just burnt wood. Um, that works really well. Uh, it gets plenty of heat to melt aluminum. Um, like I said, I've melted through the steel crucible in the past, but it's just, it's really messy. You get sparks everywhere. You have to do it outside. Um, I use a blower. I used actually a hairdryer blower. It just, and you're constantly refueling it. It's really messy and it's kind of a slow process and it's not really exacting because you, your heat kind of changes depending on how the crucible is settling through the charcoal. I didn't want to go through that process again. I wanted to build a propane burner. Um, actually I was going to build a waste oil burner and then just once again, for simplicity, simplicity, uh, I decided to go with a propane burner. Uh, the burner that I built, um, is totally just off the cuff. I, I looked at some designs online that are some really well-built burners. Um, once again, some of the fittings and stuff, I just, I can't get locally. It wasn't something I wanted to order in because like I said, it's experimental. I'm trying to keep the costs low and uh, that balance still, right? Uh, so what I ended up using is bought the fittings that I figured would probably work. Uh, had some fittings kicking around. I had an old uh, grease nipple that I used actually for the output on this and uh, connected the propane right to that nozzle. Um, soldered everything together just to make sure I wouldn't have any leaks. I didn't know how hot it would get, um, so I was kind of worried about the solder, but just the way that these burners work, these first forced air burners, or not forced air, but naturally aspirated air burners, um, they pull air across them and you're pushing propane through them, which is usually cool because it's decompressing. Uh, so they really don't have any issue with the nozzle getting the hot, that hot. And uh, if they're designed right, the burn should be happening at the end of the fire tube. Uh, which it does in this case as well. So uh, there's really no heat developed in the burner. So you could, uh, Teflon tape would be just fine. But I soldered it, um, which is probably actually lower temperature than Teflon tape. Anyways, that is another story. power of the burner, what I wanted to use was a propane regulator at about 30 PSI. 30 PSI is not a regulator I can find around here locally. They have low pressure regulators, which are about four or five PSI. It would probably be enough. Um, I just, I didn't want to spend money on a regulator that I didn't think would work. Um, and the higher pressure regulators I could get, but once again, they're about like 60, 70 bucks. Um, so I decided just to try a straight high pressure line from the tank. Horribly unsafe. Well, it's not horribly unsafe. It's unsafe if you don't, if you don't understand what you're doing. Um, Propane doesn't burn, it's not like acetylene. It, it won't burn back through a tube. It, it, it needs air to burn. Uh, so even if you just take a, a connection right to a propane, high pressure, I think a tank runs at about 120 PSI. Um, and if you just put that nozzle right to a flame and crank it full open, uh, you're gonna get a fright, an initial burst of flame, and then it's gonna blow everything out just because there's so much propane and so little air mixing with it. You just, you, it's not gonna sustain combustion without some sort of mechanism to hold that. Um, so basically I tested this burner uh, very carefully because I was still kind of sketchy about it or scared about it um, and it runs uh, the, the only problem is you have very little control with the valve of the tank because a regulator would allow you a lot more fine control but for this purpose it, it works just fine uh, this burner will burn outside of the tank or outside of the uh, furnace 
um, but it was obviously designed to work in the furnace and the furnace kind of acts as a bell housing for the end and it, there's a lot of there's a lot of theory on that you can go look it up um, but basically it functions just fine uh, especially when it heats up this burner uh, seems to actually want to run almost at full power all the time that's how it that's what it likes uh, that's where it produces a nice flame so it works perfectly and uh and like i said i designed it literally with just parts i had kicking around um i didn't think it'd be all that complicated and uh turns out it's not so once i had everything working i was confident in the propane des propane burner design and i was fairly confident that nothing would kind of explode or fall apart once i started firing it i fired it just uh over and over and over about three or four times uh, progressively getting longer and higher heats uh, just to start driving some of the moisture out of that plaster paris uh and getting rid of the steam you can see in some of the shots it's still steaming out of the little flame tube hole tire tier twire hole anyways um and that's just rest of the plaster paris on the bottom there's about two three inches of it um and that's just the steam coming out uh, it takes, takes a while to get it out. That's why I say it's probably not the best refractory material, but it would work if you want to run your furnace once or twice, like the lid held for three firings before it crumbled to pieces. Uh, so yeah, a very inexpensive way uh, to go about trying it if you, that's all you want to do. Once that was all good, we took the crucible, dropped it inside the furnace and fired it up. With these clay graphite crucibles, you want to be very careful to get all the moisture out of them. So I baked it in the oven first, and then I ran it through the forge and basically got it up to as red hot, um, or orange hot, yellow hot, really, really freaking hot. Uh, and then I shut it all down, left the lid on it, and just let it cool for the next, uh, I just let it cool overnight, actually, nice and slowly inside the foundry furnace, uh, foundry furnace, that's what it's called, not furnace, not foundry, foundry furnace. Uh, let it cool down nice and slowly, uh, just to temper the crucible, and now it should be good to go. The very last element uh, that I had to figure out was a way to get the crucible out of the furnace um, safely and a way to pour it. Uh, so I looked online and then I found, uh, I basically found a few ideas. I think it was actually on one of the King of Random videos. He made some tongs out of uh, some steel flat bar and it looked like it was actually fairly easy to cold bend. I wouldn't have assumed it, um, but I tried it and yeah, you can definitely bend eighth inch by one inch uh, steel flat bar without too much difficulty and quite decently. Um, so I built a set of tongs my hope was to be able to use the tongs to lift the crucible out and then also to uh, dump it for molds and that seemed to work out quite well. The only issue I have is my crucible is a little bit bigger than I wanted it. <laughs> I should have bought one size down in crucible but I figured the diameter was just a very small change to go from a number s number five to a number eight crucible. Uh, the, the, the diameter change was only about a quarter of an inch and the height change was about an inch. Uh, so I figured I had loads of height room so I figured I would be close. I knew it'd be close. I knew I had a half inch all around um, with that crucible, but once again, crucibles aren't exact. My furnace measurements when I was using the tape measure probably wasn't exact either. So very, very tight to get my tongs in there. It works. I had to kind of sand down some of my refractory uh, that I laid on a little thick in a few spots, but it works. Uh, so the tongs go down into the furnace. I can grab the crucible with a little bit of finagling, pull it out nice and securely. Uh, and then I can also grab it from the side and tip it into molds nice and securely. So that makes life easier because going with tongs or grips or pliers just asking for trouble that much molten aluminum i don't want to be that close to it most of the foundry work i did in the past was just lost foam casting i basically just put a chunk of foam into the cnc i cut out the pattern i want and then i would bury that pattern in sand with a couple risers coming out of it and pour the molten aluminum in the aluminum would take out the, the uh, foam and leave you with aluminum uh, that works out pretty well i'm probably going to be doing a little bit of green sand casting with it um, i might try some investment like lost foam investment or lost pla and plaster this is just kind of all on the side stuff. It's probably mostly going to be for just supporting the concrete lathe and building parts for it. Um, I'm prob I have those steel parts to make a lot of the parts of the concrete lathe, but it just the length of time it's going to take me to machine steel as opposed to machine aluminum. It's just there's really it, it, it just 
goes crazy on the time scale. So we're going to do a lot of parts in aluminum and being able to cast them to rough size and then machine them to final dimension is going to save some time as well. And it's fun to do and I like playing with that stuff. Um, I would like to end up working this foundry into the pens. I just, I don't really know if I'm going to do it. I know it'll melt brass. I'm fairly certain it'll melt brass. Um, which could let me do some neat castings. I have some really cool ideas from some other products in the future uh, from like bronze and, and brass and copper, um, but that's gonna have to wait because I have like, I have a lot of a lot of irons in the fire. So that encompasses everything. Hope in the future I'll have a few little shots and videos of the uh, foundry up and running. Um, most definitely because it's gonna be needed to complete parts with the uh, concrete lathe. Pens are progressing nicely. As with anything with good intentions, they are definitely not ready. I wanted to have five finished for the end of the month. Uh, I still have to get the stainless pocket clips in. Otherwise, they're fairly machined, fairly ready to go. Uh, I'm going to be doing the grips on those. I say that like every week that I'm going to be doing the grips. <laughs> and then the next week I say it again. But whatever, that's that's the way things go. Because uh, sometimes projects don't go exactly as planned. So I'm working on those. I'll get those to a point that I'm happy with. And then uh, we just keep going through the process. I'll probably machine some nice uh, boxes for them. Or maybe I'll package them as I did in the past. I don't know yet. It's just all in the future. In the future. So thank you guys so much for watching. As always, I will see you next time. Take care. Bye.